Words. Words are a key part of life. We use them when we wake up in the morning. We use them when we go to bed at night. And in between. We use them when we're talking to ourselves, and we use them when we're talking to people. Words are important. But you know, words that are spoken, that are true, lead to trust. If your word reflects reality, people will trust you. If your words that are spoken do not reflect reality and are not true, guess what? They lead to a lack of trust. They lead to questions and increasing amount. I don't know if I can trust you. Let me give you an example. <clears throat> Southwest Airlines. This past week, particularly last weekend, over Columbus Day weekend, they had about 2,000 flights that were delayed um, or actually canceled. The majority, many of them were canceled. And the initial claim that they did that they sent out in a statement was it was about weather. You know, I found it absolutely astounding that weather only impacts Southwest. It didn't impact American, didn't impact the United. <laughs> Obviously, <clears throat> it raised questions, and then they started backing off of the weather aspect, but the damage was already done. It's like, oh, that's what you're saying. Well, what else are you not telling us? Again, it raised questions. Another one is a supply line bottleneck that is happening at our ports around the coast. Particularly the West Coast is the majority because of although we make a lot of things come out of Asia, Southeast Asia and stuff like that. And so really backed up. <clears throat> um, they claim that it's going to affect our Christmas. And so you need to shop early because if things may not be in stock. Well, I'll tell you this. I'll give you another suggestion. Buy American made things. You know why? The supply line isn't as much an issue with them. No, no, no. Buy American-made stuff. They're here. There we go. But anyway, remember, Christmas is not about the goods. It's about the, the one who we celebrate, the birth of Christ. It's about him. Let's so make it that way this year. But the administration, I mean, the supply line you know, struggle is, is, a, is a definitely going to be a, is a concern. The administration announced a new deal to um, address this with Long Beach and Los Angeles ports, which are you know, incredibly busy ports, uh, to work 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Oh, and everybody was like, awesome, this is great. It's what we need to do. The very next day it came out that these ports were already on the process of working on that. They've been uh, doing that. Some of them, the Long Beach, have been doing it for a couple of weeks or several weeks now, some sections of it. And they're continuing to increase that. And the same thing with the Los Angeles ports. They can't just do it snap like that. They got to take a little time to be able to work this out. But they've already been working towards this. So this was not a new deal, as it was proclaimed to be and made the newsreels. And if you notice, the whole thing was in the news for one day, and then it kind of disappeared from the cycle. Why did it do that? Because it raised questions. Well, if it was already happening, what's the idea about this press release of that this is a new thing? It wasn't a new thing. You see, this is the problem, is that you have to understand that our spoken word needs to be true to reflect reality. If it doesn't, then what happens is it raises questions and people begin to doubt. When our spoken word is true and it corresponds to reality, that's what true means, it corresponds to what is real, then it can be trusted. That's exactly what God's word is and what it does. It's true, it corresponds to reality, and we can trust it. And so let's do so. Let's get right back into it. Psalm 119. It says, uh, Lord, your hands made me and formed me. Yep, I'm a creation of God. Praise be to God, he did. I am not an accident. He made me. I was designed for a purpose, his purpose. Give me understanding to learn your commands. Yes, Lord, you are my teacher. The Holy Spirit, Spirit of truth, teach me. May those who fear you <clears throat> rejoice when they see me. For I have put my hope in your word. Very briefly, when you live for Christ, that encourages me to live for Christ. When I live for Christ, it encourages you to live for Christ. Remember that. How we live matters not just to you and to the Lord, but also to those around us. I know, O Lord, that your laws are righteous, and in faithfulness you have afflicted me. Yes, I know from experience 
The reality of God's Word is so true that His Word is righteous. Why? Because it exposes my sin. It exposes my shortcomings. It exposes my, my trespasses, if you want to call them, whatever you want to call them, the sin and the wickedness in my heart. It exposes it. And the truth is that I suffer consequences because of that sin. The Word, your Word, Lord, tells me that and helps me to understand that I will suffer consequences because of what I do, because of my sin. And your word, again, points to, and my experience points to, that God, you are right, and me, I'm wrong. That's what it tells me, because God's word is real. He continues, May your unfailing love be my comfort, according to your promise to your servant. Let your compassion come to me, that I may live, for your law is my delight. May the arrogant be put to shame for wronging me without cause. But I will meditate on your precepts. May those who fear you turn to me, those who understand your statutes. May my heart be blameless toward your decrees that I may not be put to shame. In his word, God promises to love us. He promises to comfort us. He promises that he will have compassion. He promises to save us from, his, from our sin. And when we believe that word and accept that word and then live by that word, you will discover and I will discover that his word is true. That it's real. That he really does love us. That he does comfort us. He does have compassion for us. And he is saving us. You will discover the truth of his, and so many more promises, not just those, but there's so many more. His word gives us confident expectation of the fulfillment of his promises. Confident expectation is another word for hope. I'm confident. I know what's going to happen. It's not a wishful thinking. I know it, even though it's, in, even though it's coming. I know it is. As he says, my soul faints with longing for your salvation, but I have put my hope in your word. Yes, my hope in your word. That's where I find your promises, Lord. My eyes fail looking for your promise. I say, when will you comfort me? Though I am like a wineskin in the smoke, I do not forget your decrees. You know, when we go through life in this world, there's, gonna, there's suffering, there's heartache, and there's pain, and, 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 and it hurts us, and it it, it, it tears at us and it challenges us saying, well, is God really going to be like this? We have, again, we have that confident expectation. We have that hope in your word, your promises. Lord. We know your word is true because my experience shows that your word is true. And I believe it. It's real. And that's the other part I like about it is because God has put in here not just the idealistic of what it's going to be, but the realist of what it is like to live as a child of God that's of, of a part of the kingdom of heaven, to be a child of that, a citizen of heaven, and also to be living in this world of sin. There's suffering that's going to happen. It's going to be a struggle. And the psalmist here is suffering. He's longing for the fulfillment of God's promises as given in his word. He's longing for them. He knows the word is true. He relies upon his word. And he even bears the marks of suffering that come from living in this sinful world. I like the illustration he gives where it says he carries, you know, it's almost like he carries the smell of it, like kind of like the, a wineskin in the smoke. It would dry it out, it could crack it, but it would also smell. Think about yourself when you're around someone who, when you're on a campfire. What happens? Hey, it smells like smoke. Cool, campfire smoke, wood smoke, right? I mean, that's what happens. It gets on you. People know, oh, you've been by a campfire or you've been camping because you got wood smoke on you, you know? I mean, that's what happens. He carries the smell of that. That wineskin would carry that smell. You know, yeah. Okay, well, we as believers, all of us as human beings, carry that odor of living in a sin-filled evil world. We have the marks for it. We have the cracks in our life. We have the scars of it. We have the suffering and the heartache and stuff. Yes, we have that. In other words, we have the marks, just like that wineskin would be with the, with the smoke that would dry it out and it would lead to cracking and all this stuff and, and, and the odor on it stuff. Yeah, it would have that. But yet, guess what? We still have God's hope 
the promises that are given in His Word. We know Again, we know His Word is true, and we're waiting for the ultimate fulfillment of all of that. And He says, How much, excuse me, how long must your servant wait? When will you punish my persecutors? Yeah. The arrogant dig pit, pitfalls for me, contrary to your law. All your commands are trustworthy. Help me, for men persecute me without cause. They almost wipe me from the earth, but I have not forsaken your precepts. Preserve my life according to your love, and I will obey the statutes of your mouth. People falsely accuse others because they don't agree with them. Yeah, that happens a lot. You don't see things the way I do? Well, guess what? You don't do things the way I do? You don't think in the way I do? Guess what? you got to be silenced. Matter of fact, we're going to cancel you. That's cancel culture. That has become pretty prevalent today. Let me give you an example of the hypocrisy of cancel culture. Not only the hypocrisy of it, but how it's, it's all about just, just they, they pick their victims. They pick certain ones for certain reasons. There's an NFL coach who resigned this past week because of some private emails in which he, he wrote some pretty bad stuff. I mean, I'm not defending him at all. What, he's, what he said was not good. It was, it was bad, okay? Um, but he wrote it a decade ago. Then you also have um, the Madden football game, the video game, if you know that one. They removed his coach's likeness off of, their, off of the game, so he's not in there anymore. Yet, the NFL has employed players who have been guilty of spousal abuse, sexual assault, child abuse, DUI, attempted murder, and guess what? They didn't fire them. So you could do those violent things just as long as you didn't say the wrong things. That's the way cancel culture works. It doesn't, it's, it's not a uniform rule. It's just they pick their targets and then they go after their victims to silence them and to remove them from their position. Students in high schools are, are doing the same type of thing. It's like a bullying type of thing. You pick on the victim that you can easily pick on, and you do. They're actually, they found now that some high school kids are making lists of kids that they want to cancel. Silence. That's basically bully activity. We do it in our world, too. And the same thing was happening with the psalmist. He was being bullied. He was being picked on. He was being chosen. Why? Because, as we've read, or as read earlier, did this. Why? Because he followed God's way. Because he followed God's law. For us, it would be like, because you follow, as a Christian, because you follow Jesus Christ, and because you will stand for him and you will live for him, you will be persecuted. You will be picked on because of that. I mean, other people picked on because they have some sort of, you know, physical disability. Or maybe because they have a different name or because they dress a little differently, whatever it is. The, the bullies will always pick on someone that they choose, and the rest of them will, will flock, and they will just target that one. It's, they're totally inconsistent. It's total hypocrisy, but that's what they will do. This is not new. It was happening to the psalmist. He was being accused falsely. And, but it says, despite all of that, despite the suffering and the struggle, he would not leave the truth of the Word of God. He would not turn his back on it. Because the Word of God, he says, it, it preserves my life. Truth does that. Truth will preserve you. He follows the way of truth. Why? Look at this. He says, your word is eternal. This is verse 89. It stands firm in the heavens. Your faithfulness continues through all generations. You establish the earth and it endures. Your laws endure to this day for all things serve you. Yeah, this is what Jesus, he confirms this. Matthew chapter, eight, five, chapter 5, verse 18, Jesus says, I assure you, until heaven and earth disappear, even the smallest detail of God's law will remain until its purpose is achieved. In other words, the law ain't God, that God's word, his law, his precepts, his statutes, his, all of that stuff, ain't going to disappear, guys. It's going to stay here. Now, when all things come to be accomplished and everything like that, maybe there'll be some changes because they won't have to have the sin will be no more and stuff like that. And I praise God for that. That will be awesome. But it's going to be here. It's not going anywhere. That's what Jesus says. That's what the psalmist says. God endures. Your creation endures. Your word endures. I will trust it because truth always endures. Lies don't. I will follow the truth. 
92, he says, If your law had not been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have preserved my life. Save me, for I am yours. I have sought out your precepts. The wicked are waiting to destroy me, but I will ponder your statutes. To all perfection I see a limit, but your commands are boundless. I love this section, uh, particularly the last phrase there, verse 96, the last verse. Perfection. When you think of something being perfect, what he's talking about here is completion with nothing more to do. You have a task at hand. You have a project at home. Maybe you're redoing the kitchen, redoing a table, or you're, you're adding something, you're organizing something, establishing a new computer. I don't know. Whatever it is, you're like, you're done with it. You're like, you know what? Perfect. There's nothing more to do. It's complete. What he says about God's word is that it's boundless. What does that mean? What it means is that it speaks to all times and manners of life. It doesn't matter what time period it is. It doesn't matter what situation is. God's word will speak into it. Because that's what truth does. Truth is real. When it's real, it speaks into almost anything. And that's what God's word does. It's boundless. So it applied in Abraham's day, what he had. It applied in David's day, Jesus' day, and our day, and even our great Great, great grandkids or whatever day, how many, whatever long the earth endures. Because God's word, it's a living word. And the living word keeps on speaking because it's real. He continues. He says, oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. Your commands make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more insight than all my teachers, for I meditate on your statutes. I have more understanding than the elders, for I obey your precepts. Yeah, teachers in the state of Pennsylvania, and I believe in many other states too, are mandated reporters when it comes to child abuse laws. If they recognize it, and they see it, and they hear about it, they need to report it. And many times it's a frontline reporter, which means they go immediately to, you know, the child abuse hotlines or whatever line or whatever they're have set up in their state in order to report it. Sexual abuse is a big problem. I mean, any kind of abuse, but also sexual abuse in particular is a big problem in our country. Well, um, even though teachers are mandated reporters, the Department of Education, a report that came out not that long ago, actually reports that. There are 10 per, that what it amounts to is that 10 percent of our children slash youth were targets of our or are targets of sexual misconduct by teachers. 10 percent. That's a lot. That's way. One is too many, but I mean that is just 10 percent. You that's horrible. That's what it was. It was 10 percent. You see, knowledge does not equate to understanding. In other words, you have teachers. Now, again, most of the teachers are absolutely fantastic. Praise be to God, we have so many good, good teachers out there. But there are some bad apples too. And the problem is the system has protected them for the most part. No, they cannot be protected. They must be exposed and rooted out. What it means is that if you've got a teacher, one of these bad apples, what they do is they hear about it and they're trained in this. And in fact, they've got to be a frontline reporter and taught how child abuse and sexual abuse is wrong for children. Yep, yep, absolutely. Sure. Do they understand it? No, because then they go and do it. So they don't understand it. When you understand something, you do it. You obey it. You realize, yes, you're right. That is good. I agree with that. I understand that. You're right. I shouldn't be doing that. So then you will not do it. Living according to, that is obeying the standard. God's standard, preferable. But even if it's the world standard, means that you understand that standard. And that's what he's saying here. He says, I understand more than the elders. He had elders who were teaching people, but they, weren't, they didn't really understand because they weren't doing it. That's what he's implying. But this, the psalmist is saying, I understand. They have more understanding. Why? Because I do what you're asking me, Lord. I'm following your way. I have kept my feet, he says in verse 101, from every evil path so that I might obey your word. Yeah, he recognizes, he has understanding that God's way is the righteous way and the, all the other ways are nothing but 
stealing, killing, and destroying, and all kinds of garbage. Every wicked way he's avoided. He says, I have not departed from your laws, for you yourself have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. I gain understanding from your precepts, therefore I hate every wrong path. Yes, he gains understanding as he lives it, as he learns it, and lives it, and learns it, and lives it. There's a pattern going on here, okay? He says he will hate every wrong path. I can hate every wrong path. It's okay to do this. They say, well, you shouldn't hate anything. No, I'll hate evil. I should hate sin. I hate every wrong path because it's a sinful path. I hate it because it destroys, it steals, and it kills, just like the devil himself does. And we have seen too many lives that follow the path of lies, that follow the path of the devil, and they have destroyed their life. They've killed their life. They've ended their life because of that. The psalmist knows that the right path, he knows what it is. Why? Because he understands from the precepts and the commands and God's word. He understands it, but he also lives it. So he knows it's true. Not just because the word says it's true, but also because he lives it and has experienced it. It is real. I can trust God's word because it is real. Verse 105 says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. Yes, I'm, I'm following on that path. I've got the light. It lights my way because there's darkness in this world. So I want to challenge you to do something when you get home this evening. When you get home, what I want you to do is I want you to turn on, turn on the lights in the one room when it's dark out. And I want you to go to your closet, preferably a room with a closet, obviously. And I want you to open up that door and I want you to see what happens. I'll tell you actually what will happen, because you know what will happen. You've done it probably many times, you've never even thought about it. The darkness comes flying out of the closet and envelops the whole room, right? No. The light goes into the darkness. The darkness never advances on the light. See, darkness only advances when the light is hidden or removed. When you hide the light and remove the light, that's when darkness can advance. God's Word is light. As he says, it, it, it's, it's light. It lights the way. Jesus is the light of the world. So when you and I believe his word as, as believers, when we believe his word, when we live according to his word, we will have this light of Christ that is in us. And it will shine forth so the world can see. That is, shine the light into what? The darkness of our world. When we live for him, we are shining his light so the world can see but if we pull back on that light, we hide living for Christ. We don't live for Christ. We don't live according to his way. We pull back. Guess what happens? Darkness advances because we pull back or withdraw or hide the light. That might help you understand a little bit what's been, what started going on in this pandemic and during this time period. Too many have stopped sharing the light, living a court, doing what God has asked. They're doing more what they want to do. And what happens? The light is pulled back and the darkness has advanced. That certainly is what has happened. So we need to be careful. We need to live by the light. Show that light. Because when we do proclaim the light, guess what happens? Like that closet. You open it up. Where does the darkness go? It flees because light invades. That's what the church needs to be, out in the world and letting the light of Christ invade the world so we can be a city on a hill, a light that is so easily seen. He says, I have taken an oath and confirmed it, that I will follow your righteous laws. I have suffered much. Preserve my life, O Lord, according to your word. Accept, O Lord, the willing praise of my mouth and teach me your laws. Though I constantly take my life in my hands, I will not forget your law. Kind of a little bit of a somber piece here. When you stand against the darkness by living according to God's word, you know, live according to the light, there's going to be danger there. You tell others, there's, there's a risk there. There's, there is some danger there. Because you're in a bad, you're in the midst of, we're in the midst of a spiritual battle. So there is going to be danger there because others will take note. Some will be drawn to the light. Others will, re, hmm, will not, will fight against it. They won't like the light. But it says that I suffered much. You know, the Bible talks about us as believers as suffering. Not a pleasant thought. The psalmist is not talking about just suffering because of disease. 
He's talking about suffering because he is following God's way. He's living according to God's word. So for you and I, I'd be like, I'm following Christ because I believe in Jesus Christ. I'm suffering because of that. Or why would I suffer? I mean, if I'm doing, following God's righteous path, why would I suffer? Well, think of it this way. If you hit your head on something, which I happen to do a bit, those of you who have hair, it's a lot nicer because you kind of feel it before you hit your head. But regardless, when you do, it hurts. But it's not just my head that hurts. The rest of my body feels it too. Now, my toe doesn't ache, but it knows that I got hit in the head. It hurts. You stub your toe, believe me. The rest of your body is affected too. It hurts, doesn't it? Same thing here. Who's the head of the church? The body of Christ. <laughs> Jesus, right? And he suffered for us, didn't he? He suffered mightily for us. He's the head. So why then would the body not feel that suffering, that pain? So yeah, we will suffer because we are suffering the, we are feeling in a way the sufferings of Christ. That's when we suffer for because we are a follower of Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about you get a cold. I'm talking about you're suffering specifically because you are a believer in Jesus Christ. Because someone doesn't like what you agree with. They target you like the psalmist here. He's, you're persecuted. You're insulted. You're not included in some things because they just don't want a Christian there. There are dangers. There's risks and costs. But I will gladly suffer for Christ because I belong to him. And he suffered for me, and so I will feel that knowing that that's how much he loves me. Verse 110, it tells us that the wicked have set a snare for me, but I have not strayed from your precepts. No, I'm not going to abandon them. Your statutes are my heritage forever. Yes, I want this to be carried on. They are the joy of my life. Excuse me, of my heart. My life, my heart. My heart is set on keeping your decrees to the very end. You know, many people will try to distract you and I any believer in Jesus Christ to live other ways. With all kinds of glitzy things from our world, you know, looking at something fancy and glittery and shiny and say, look at this, look at this. Oh, look at this, isn't this cool? Wow, ooh, yeah, okay. Um, technology. Or maybe they'll try to do things to distract us um, with everyone else is doing it. Why don't you do it? Come on, man, don't be an out, don't be, you know, you're the only one. Come on, everybody else is doing it. It's okay, can everybody be wrong? You know, things like that. They'll try to do that. Or they'll try to do things like to uh, discredit God's word. They'll make false claims about it, saying, well, yeah, some of it's true, but not all of it. It was all made by men. You know, you got to pick and choose what's real and what's not. And so what they'll do is they'll, they'll pull out a piece, kind of like a middle piece of a middle of a puzzle, and they'll look at it and say, look at this. You see this on here? This is, this is a bad thing. You see, there's blood on this piece of puzzle. And you look at it, and you're like, that's not blood. No, 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 this is blood. How can you do a puzzle that deals with blood and gory stuff like this? It's terrible. How can you put together a puzzle that's filled with blood? That is absolutely terrible. And, you know, and what they're doing is, they're saying, how can you support that? They'll do that with the Bible. How can you support a God who does this? And they'll pull out a verse or a couple of verses and do that. And you're like, well, wait a minute. Well, I, you know, and they get you kind of hemming and hawing, and you're not sure. Well, with the puzzle piece, what do you do? You take it, you put it back into the puzzle and say, look at that. It's not blood. It's a rose. Oh, okay. That changes it, doesn't it? Well, when you take those verses, put it back in a context, say, here's the context. Let me talk to you about the context of what God did here. It changes it. The Word of God is real. Yeah, you can take pieces of it and twist the meaning of it. When you put it all together, you realize that, whoa, this is real. It's enduring. It's eternal. And you know what? It has withstood every single challenge it has ever faced in its life. In fact, the whole time that we've had His Word. It has withstood every challenge. <laughs> you know, the funny thing is, is <laughs> that's what truth does. I mean, we shouldn't be shocked. Truth does endure. It lasts. Why? Because it's real. That's why. <laughs> Lies are not. And so lies will fail. Lies will change. But the truth never does. And the truth never goes out of style either. The truth is always in vogue, if you will. The Word of God can be and it must be trusted and lived out. That's if you want to really, truly live your life and be free. 
Let's pray. Dear God, again, I want to keep the prayer simple. I thank you for your word, for your living word that is sharper than any double-edged sword. It separates the good from the bad, and it separates the sin from the righteousness, and it's so revealing, Lord, and convicting through your spirit. I thank you for it, for the truthfulness of it, the reality of it, and how you, you don't just paint an ideal picture. You, you paint the real picture of us living in a sinful world. You understand. And I pray today, this very simply, that you would help me and help each one of us who are listening, each one of us who, um, who's walking with you or just thinking about you or whatnot, that you would help us, Lord, to take your word seriously. Not only would we take it seriously and read it, but then we would actually, the parts we understand, we would actually take and we would live according to it. And we come to understand that it really is real. That, yeah, it's true. Help us, Lord, to do this. There's a lot of darkness out there, and the, need, and the world needs light. We want to be the light of the world, a city on a hill, that people can look to and come to you. That's what we ask, Lord. Empower us through your Holy Spirit to live by your word. Your word that is true, that is enduring, that is real. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.